This series is about the relationship that exists between those of us who live in countries like Canada and the United States and the majority of the world's people, some 80% of the world's people, who live in that group of countries that we commonly refer to as the third world. This street corner in Fredericton, New Brunswick may seem an odd place to begin such a series, but I wanted to start with this plaque. It doesn't have anything to do with the third world at all. My name is Rick McDaniel. I'm the International Program Director for the YMCA of Fredericton, and I'm an immigrant to Canada. I came here in 1967 from the United States in order to attend university, and I've lived here ever since. Of course, Canada and the United States are a lot alike, but I prefer to live here. I've chosen to live here, to raise my family here. On the other hand, there were some things I found when I first came to Canada that I had a little bit of difficulty with, things that I still have some difficulty with even though I've lived here half my life, things like this plaque. Now, I realize that it doesn't really commemorate Benedict Arnold, but it comes close enough to make me feel uncomfortable. Because, of course, everyone in the United States knows who Benedict Arnold was. He was the most despised traitor since Judas. He went over to the side of the enemy during the American Revolution. In other words, he joined what people in New Brunswick call the Loyalists, the men and women who remained loyal to the king, George III, whose portrait still hangs just over here in the New Brunswick legislature. I can't look at this portrait in the same way that someone born in Canada or Britain might because I see it from a point of view that's the product of my heritage and my education, a point of view that now makes up part of my personality. For someone who's proud of their loyalist heritage, then remaining loyal to the king was commendable. For me, George III will have always been the enemy. So what's that got to do with a series on the third world? Not a thing. But the topic of point of view has quite a lot to do with it. This series was written by a North American, me, and it's addressed to an audience primarily made up of other North Americans, or at least an audience made up of people who live in the developed nations of the North, the 20% of the world's population that doesn't happen to live in the third world. And our starting point has to be to recognize that we each have a point of view, a way of seeing things. More importantly, to recognize that that point of view is something that we acquired. It's something that we learned, something we were taught. In the same way I was taught to see George III as a villain. When we're young, our point of view is fairly flexible, but it becomes more rigid as we get older, as we form opinions and adopt beliefs. Once our point of view has been established, once we've expended time and energy in defending and advocating certain opinions, those opinions become part of our personality. The beliefs, attitudes, values, and habits which make up our point of view are partly what distinguish us as a particular individual. Our point of view is such an intimate part of ourselves that by and large we're not even aware of it. It's simply the way we see things. It's the way we perceive the world. It's natural for us to feel that our way of seeing things is the correct way of seeing things, the normal way of seeing things. When we encounter people with a different point of view, we assume that their way of seeing things is wrong, or at least inadequate. And yet, none of us was born with a point of view. It's something that we acquired. It's the product of our conditioning, our training. It's the result of a whole series of factors over which we had no control whatsoever. Our culture, heritage, family, the education system we've passed through, the contemporary popular culture surrounding us, the television programs and movies we watch, the books we read, the music, the lyrics of the songs we listen to. Had any of these, or a whole series of other experiences or influences been different, then our point of view, our normal way of seeing things, would also have been different. Well, Cultures have points of view as well. That's partly what distinguishes them from one another. I think that's pretty obvious in Canada. All you have to do is compare the way that the Quebecois look at certain issues with the way that Anglophone Canadians look at those same issues, 
and you've got a pretty good example of the type of thing I'm talking about. But the situation is even more extreme when we leave Canada. Clearly, there are differences between the way Anglophones and Francophones look at things. But those differences are minor compared with the differences between either of these and the points of view of a wide variety of cultures existing in different parts of the world. Compare, for example, the point of view of either an English or a French Canadian with that of a fundamentalist Muslim living in Iran or a Communist Party member living in China. This whole issue of point of view affects the way in which we relate to other countries and other cultures. It affects our ability to understand them. It affects our ability to communicate with them. It affects our ability to work with them. And there are a number of very serious reasons why we should be concerned about that. Consider, for example, what happened at the United Nations Earth Summit held in Rio de Janeiro back in 1992. Representatives from countries like Canada went down to the Earth Summit with the sincere intention of seeking solutions to the very real environmental problems we're facing globally. We went down there with the belief that these issues can't be addressed by a single country or even by a group of countries. The only way they can adequately be dealt with is if all the nations of the world cooperate. We also went down assuming that our point of view was self-evident. So it was a surprise to get down to Brazil and discover that a large group of countries, in particular the third world countries, didn't seem interested in our point of view. In fact, some editorial writers in Canada suggested that what the third world delegates did was try to hijack the agenda of the summit and switch topics. You see, they wanted to talk about poverty. In effect, they appeared to say that if we expected their help in addressing global environmental problems, then we had to address their concerns about poverty first. A lot of people, in particular the environmentalists who had worked so hard preparing for the Earth Summit, were understandably irritated by this. It wasn't that they didn't consider third world poverty an important issue. They just weren't sure that the Earth Summit was the appropriate forum to discuss it. What we really had in Brazil was a problem with point of view, a problem with the difference between the way delegates from countries like Canada were looking at things and the way the delegates from the third world were looking at things. These third world nations now make up nearly four-fifths of the Earth's population. Yet they only have access to something like 20% of the Earth's wealth, even when that wealth originates in their countries. The collective debt of the developing countries is so large that the total amount of foreign aid these nations received in 1992, the year of the Earth Summit, was $100 billion less than they paid in the interest on that debt. The result, of course, is that in net terms, more money, in 1992, $100 billion more, goes from poor countries to rich countries each year rather than the other way around. Life expectancy throughout the third world is, on average, 15 years less than it is in Canada. There are 800 million persons in developing countries suffering from malnutrition. Nearly 2 billion lack access to clean water. Daily, some 25,000 children die in developing countries from either malnutrition or preventable disease. That's 26 a minute, more than 200 since this program began. Given those conditions, concern about the environment, we were told in Rio, simply isn't a luxury third world nations can afford. We in the North, on the other hand, are beginning to recognize that we can't afford not to be concerned about the environment. And if nothing else came out of the Earth Summit, I hope we left it with an understanding that a genuine concern about the environment means being concerned about the elimination of third world poverty. Our point of view has to be united with the point of view of the Earth's majority if we're going to be able to accomplish anything. And if we don't hear that point of view, if we don't make an effort to understand the other perspective, then we can't hope to work with the third world on the environment or on any number of other issues that affect both of us. Before we go any further, Let's consider where this term, the third world, came from. 
It was first used in 1952 by a French writer, Albert Sauvet, who was making what amounts to a play on words. There's an older French expression, the third estate, which referred to the members of society who lacked the privileges of the nobility or the clergy prior to the French Revolution. So the marginalized members of society were the third estate. In inventing the term third world, Sauvé was making a distinction between two industrialized worlds of privilege, the capitalist West and communist East, with a marginalized third world, which at that time, in the 1950s, was still primarily agricultural. After Sauvé published his work, some of the countries of Latin America, Asia, and Africa adopted the term at the United Nations as a way of distinguishing themselves from the two superpower blocks. Today, however, because the term appears to imply a ranking of nations, it's fallen out of favor in some circles, and some alternate expressions have been sought. Now this group of countries is sometimes referred to as developing countries, lesser developed countries, southern countries, the majority world, and so on. But third world is still the term most people are familiar with. It's difficult to make generalizations about an area this large, an area which includes all of Africa, all of Latin America, and most of Asia. However, there are some characteristics which developing countries, if I can use that term for a moment, do have in common. Of course, all countries are developing countries in some sense. When we use that term for this particular group of countries, I suppose we mean countries which are still developing their ability to provide for the basic needs of their citizens. And if we use that definition of developing country, then that's what we have here. Or at least what we have here is a reconstruction of a developing country. This is King's Landing historical settlement outside of Fredericton. It's a recreation of what life was like in the maritime provinces back in the 18th and 19th centuries. And it's a pretty good example of what I meant by a country which is still developing its ability to provide for the needs of its citizens. Let's consider what life was like in Canada back in, say, 1868, when the nation was only one year old. Well, like many current third world countries, at that time, Canada was basically agricultural and, in fact, was generally self-sufficient in food production. Although the food supply was seasonal and for long periods each year, people had to live on stored or preserved foods. On the other hand, the cost of this self-sufficiency was that most of the labor in the country was involved in food production in one way or another. The rest of the national economy was based primarily on the production of raw materials through mining and forestry. There were a few factory jobs, but they were pretty appalling. Wages were low, workers had to put in long hours six days a week without holidays, and without employee benefits. There was no unemployment insurance, no workman's compensation, no pension plans, or social assistance. And of course, it was long before Medicare. There were few hospitals, and those that did exist were located in the cities. The problem with that was that most of the population still lived in rural areas and had no access to them. The death rate for children under five was high. There was also a high rate of death for women during childbirth. The medical system was unable to prevent the spread of diseases like typhus, typhoid, diarrhea, and dysentery although with proper sanitation, all of these are relatively easy to control. Tuberculosis and childhood parasites were common. Life expectancy was about 55 years, roughly what it is today in a country like Ghana. As a result of the high infant mortality rate and the lack of pension plans and other welfare programs for the elderly, families tended to be large. 
The national average was that a couple needed to produce six children in order to be fairly sure that there would be at least one son who would survive to adulthood and take on financial responsibility for his parents. Families of 12 or more were common. Most of these children received only rudimentary education. There wasn't much of an education system in the country to begin with, but the fact of the matter was that children were taken out of school by their parents in order to be put to work on the farms. And even with half a dozen children working, most families were just getting by. They would be able to provide food, clothing, and shelter, but not much more. There were, of course, a wide variety of modern consumer and luxury products available in the markets, but most families didn't have enough income to be able to purchase them. Most people had very limited mobility. There was the famed national railway system, but it missed most communities. And other than by rail, about the only way to get around was by horse, boat, or foot. The roads were generally unpaved and often impassable. As a result, most people never traveled more than five or ten miles from where they were born. Well, that could almost be a description of a third world country today. And perhaps that should give us some reason for optimism. After all, if Canada could develop from these conditions to becoming the country which the United Nations keeps telling us is the best in the world to live in, then perhaps there's hope for today's developing countries as well. And while that might be true, there are some other things that have to be taken into consideration as well. Think for a moment about what makes historical reconstructions like King's Landing so popular. Why do people enjoy visiting them? And at least in part, the answer is nostalgia, the longing for what seems to be a simpler way of life. I think one of the particular attractions of places like King's Landing is the apparent self-sufficiency of the villagers, their self-reliance. They imported some luxury items, as we said, like tea and coffee, but on the whole, they provided for their own needs. Things are very different today. Just consider this. Now, this is really an incredible little miracle, especially if you were to look at it from the point of view of someone who lived in a place like King's Landing 150 years ago. But we take them for granted, because of course you can get them just about anywhere, including here at the King's Landing Canteen. This is a Canadian chocolate bar. It says so right here on the label, manufactured in Canada. But look at the list of ingredients. Peanuts, sugar, palm oil, coconut oil, chocolate, rice, cocoa butter. This is one of the biggest differences between the way things used to be and the way they are now. Today, we really do live in what's come to be called a global village, a global marketplace. And there are some obvious advantages to a country like Canada in this situation. After all, we can take it for granted that we'll have all the coffee, tea, citrus fruits, bananas, and sugar we want, even though we can't grow any of these things in our climate. But there are some other consequences of this global economy, which have had a pretty devastating effect on the nations of the third world. The sheer size of the debt that these nations owe Western banks has largely been the result of financial decisions which were made outside of their borders, decisions over which the people of the third world had no control. This is something we'll look at in our next program. So while a useful comparison can be made between the way things used to be in Canada and the way they are today in the third world, we also have to keep in mind that today's developing countries are facing situations and problems that Canada didn't have 150 years ago. There's one more point worth making before we leave King's Landing, and it brings us back to the topic of point of view. I've said that this is a recreation of life in a developing country, life in a nation in which the people are still developing their ability to provide for their own basic needs. It was a hard life in many respects. People worked long hours at difficult tasks simply in order to survive. 
But when we think of Canada's pioneer days, we don't think of them as being a gloomy time, do we? We know that they didn't have the same standard of living we have, but we also recognize that they were fully capable of living happy, fulfilled, and useful lives. I think one of the problems we have with our perception of the third world is that for many of us, about all we know of these countries comes from television and magazine advertisements asking us to adopt a child in a developing country, or from media coverage, which tends to overlook third world countries unless they're reporting on natural disasters or political instability, or even from series like this one, which focus on the difficulties these nations are facing. I think it's important to keep in mind during this series that while we will tend to focus on the bleaker side of life in the third world, there's another point of view as well. People in third world countries are just as capable of living happy, fulfilled, and useful lives as the people living in Canada 150 years ago were. The cultures of developing countries have a lot to offer us in terms of beauty and in terms of understanding human values. Hopefully, the riches of their cultures won't be lost in their pursuit of progress and development. If we choose to work with the people of the third world for our mutual benefit in seeking solutions to problems which affect both of us, then we must do so with a respect for their cultures and their points of view, and with a recognition that they're going to have as much to bring to this process as we do. No matter what time of year it is, the Maritime Gardener has tips you can use. Come grow with us, Tuesdays at 8.30 on Channel 10, TVNB, your window on New Brunswick. Daddy, mm. can you read me a story? Daddy's so tired. Ask Mommy. Isn't it about time? From the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Music to get your feet stomping and more fun than a maritime kitchen party. Bugs Green's got it Fridays at 9 on Channel 10, TVNB. Join Andrew Holland Wednesdays at 8.30 for New Brunswick Forum, The Year in Review, covering the issues that concern you most, only on Channel 10 TVNB.
landmines leave gaping holes in too many lives. Please help fill them in. Dennis Wilson hooks the big ones on Tight Lines, New Brunswick's only fishing show. Mondays at 7.30 on Channel 10 TVNB. The past and present collide as New Brunswick's history is brought to life on Portraits. Fridays at 8.30 only on Channel 10 TVNB. Your window on New Brunswick. in the classroom, tears down walls, opens minds, provided as an educational service to schools by participating Canadian cable companies. For the tastiest dishes from around the province, take a peek at the menu on Tide's Table, Thursdays at 8.30, only on Channel 10, TVNB. Turn your home into a house of hidden treasures. For Your Furniture shows you how step-by-step step, every Saturday at 6.30 on Channel 10 TVNB. Epic adventure. Timeless drama. Give me the bomb. Just give it to me. And unforgettable faces. Brought to life on film. Books. Spiritually dangerous books. The greatest movies of all time with the biggest stars of all time. Remarkable stories that are History on Film. Wednesday through Saturday nights at 8 Eastern, 9 Pacific on History Television. The best up and coming acts from around the province, featuring some of the industry's biggest names, all packed into one great hour. Friday Night Rocks, 10 o'clock Fridays on Channel 10, TVNB. The New Brunswick Community Television Archive, exploring New Brunswick's history of community television programming, is an educational initiative of CHCO-TV.